the Royal Society was founded in 1660, and for the first 285 years, it was a place exclusively for men. Finally, in 1945, Kathleen Lonsdale and Marjorie Stevenson became the first two female fellows. On the 80th anniversary of Marjorie Stevenson's election, I spent a day with biochemist Judy Armitage, herself a fellow of the Royal Society, to discover more about Marjorie's life and work. Distinguished as a biochemist, particularly in the field of bacterial metabolism, and we see this. We, the undersigned, propose and recommend, and they've crossed out him <laughs> yes. deserving that honour and is likely to become a useful and valuable member. President of the Society for the General Microbiology. Oh, yeah, I think that's key. 1943-ish, she started this drive to bring microbiologists together. She had this vision that all microbiologists ought to be talking to each other yes. because microbes actually interact with each other. I and, see. and so she. So just as they communicate, we, we so should she, communicate. She was the driving force for the formation of the Society for General Microbiology. They tried to persuade her to be the first president, but she didn't think she was worthy. And Alexander Fleming became the first president. When his stint finished, he persuaded her to be the second president. And of course, another connection from that is I became president of the Microbiology Society. Okay. So, you know. Marjorie died only three years later in 1948. But what she achieved in her 63 years was extraordinary. Born in Burwell, a small town near Cambridge, she grew up in the flat, watery landscape of the Fens. Her father was a successful farmer who was interested in contemporary science. At an early age, her intelligence was recognised by her governess. And when she was 18, her mother insisted she go to Newnham College, Cambridge. There she is. It's all women, so yes. it's an all-women college. Yes. And, of course, you know, at that time, the biochemistry department wouldn't let women into the labs. Uh, uh, so knew them had to have its own labs. Oh, so the women did their so experimental work. Here, within yeah. the safe confines of a ladies' college. Exactly. exactly. How strange. But I can imagine then this was really important. In Marjorie's time at Newnham, women could study but were not awarded degrees. Fifteen years after she graduated, there was a vote on whether women should be granted full membership of the university with equal degrees to the men. The motion failed. And celebrating their victory, almost 1,500 male students attacked Newnham College, chanting, we don't want women, smashing windows and attempting to break down the gates. Marjorie's reaction to the culture among male academics was withering. These young men fuss about their reputations as if they were ageing virgins in a Victorian novel. Now, isn't that brilliant? Yes, yeah. yeah. She really was disparaging about young men going after fame and fortune. After graduating, Marjorie moved to London to teach household science to young women, which she found totally unfulfilling. Luckily, she met a professor at University College London who invited her to join his research group. Just as her career in research was about to take off, the First World War broke out. Marjorie immediately volunteered for the Red Cross. And in October 1914, she was one of the very first members of a volunteer aid detachment to be sent abroad. In 1917, under Marjorie's management, 2.4 million meals were prepared for injured soldiers, including a mix of wheat flour and enzymes for men who could not digest regular rations. By the end of the war, she was the recipient of multiple medals and awards, including an MBE. Returning to Cambridge, Marjorie joined the Department of Biochemistry, set up by Frederick Gowland Hopkins. I think he probably was a remarkable chap. Just look 
at this photograph. This one, I think, is really striking. 1916, there are only nine people in the lab and four of them are women. And so who was responsible for that? It has to be Garland Hopkins. It must sort of encapsulate his effect on laboratory culture. And Marjorie Stevenson. Oh, there she is. There she is, <laughs> yes. Hopkins appointed her in 1919, and that's when she started working on bacteria. She was persuaded to work on microbes because I think it was thought they were going to be a lot simpler. And, you know, it was a way of getting at the fundamental chemistry of things. Yes. Because that's what people were interested in is, you know, yes. how we work. Yes, in multiple cells and things like that. But, but she realised very early on she had to grow the bacteria in sort of defined media. And then you feed them with different things and you see what comes out the other ends. And that's, you can start then to think about what the chemistry must be. So in the past, when people were studying bacteria... They were growing in some sort of broth, some sort of soup. Um, but, but not but, of a defined yes, uh, recipe. Exactly. She was looking at E. coli eating formic acid and realised that if you had them in oxygen, then you ended up with different end products to if you had them without oxygen. So there was something different going on if you had them in different environments. And it means you can look at anaerobic environments, you can look at inorganic environments, and you can then start to understand nowadays, you know, how can they digest plastics, <laughs> yes. you know, or yes. oil or anything else that we can't. And I find it remarkable that she was doing this in the sort of 1920s, 30s. In 1928, Marjorie and her colleague Leonard Strickland were the first scientists ever to isolate a bacterial enzyme from the cell. It changed the way that biochemistry was done, I think, in general. But she also made us recognise that microbes are actually really very complex. She said that, yes, what you saw in animals and plants and microbes, yes, they did have a lot in common, but when you got down to looking at microbes in general, they did an awful lot more. I see. We now know that they respond to huge ranges of signals, and that's you know how they communicate with each other and how they communicate with you or communicate with the plant in the soil or <laughs> so I'm thinking else. all the bacteria in my stomach. <laughs> yes. We've got this much deeper understanding that's built on her legacy. Although it was years before she had a permanent position, Marjorie thrived in Hopkins' Department of Biochemistry. In 1930, she published Bacterial Metabolism, which became required reading for microbiologists all over the world. She also embarked on a series of public radio broadcasts, which inspired the next generation of microbiologists. Dee Dee Woods said, I became interested in chemical microbiology at 8.30 p.m. on Friday the 9th of May, 1930, when I heard Marjorie Stevenson's broadcast, Biochemistry, What It Is and What It Does. Marjorie also wrote humorous pieces for Brighter Biochemistry, the department's satirical newsletter. Oh, I like this. Uh, down the microscope and what Alice found there. Alice was getting very tired of looking down the microscope, trying to see all the things her professor told her she ought to see. And this is actually written by Marjorie. Yes, it was in picture. Yes. Because I was thinking, that's Alice in wonder. <laughs> what is she doing then? Who's that? Hateful little things, said Alice. I don't believe they're there at all. I wish I could go down there and have a look. I mean, there is a bit of serious feminism, I think, that oh, comes yeah. out in some of it. When Adam Delved and Eve Spann, who was then a gentleman, and there you have the male academic in the oh, library with his, with his with books, his book, reading and thinking. He's looking very relaxed there. And there's female academic. Oh, my goodness. Sitting in the cold, in the Bunsen <gasps> yes. burner. <laughs> it's a Bunsen burner for warmth. Yeah. <laughs> I love this because this is the sort of thing I do for uh, science communication for yeah. kids. But who was this for? This was for the department. And it, it actually shows that people were witty and <laughs> yes. human. And, yes. and I think what it does is it illustrates that this department then was sort of a vibrant oh. community, really got on with each other and exchanged you know, fun yeah. ideas. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think she was an amazing character. My dear Sydney, I propose to explode a rocket under your chair because I realise that if I don't, no one will. 
it is this, dear Sydney, your lecturing habit, oh. which has become very bad and must be remedied because we cannot afford to let it go on. Which is amazing because you know, I've heard from my old mentor, Pat Clark, who was taught by her, that she wasn't a very good lecturer herself. Oh, see. <laughs> so pot calling kettle black here. <laughs> but, but it was so important to her that the next generation were actually being yes. taught and brought through. Yes. Her legacy, she thought, were her graduate students, and she gave them the credit for a lot of the research that they did when they were in her lab. Yes. So and the they ego took wasn't that involved. On. No. Because I, I know many academics who would <laughs> yes, subsume yes. all the credit. Yeah. You get no impression of there being an ego here. Mm. You get an impression of somebody who is just curious, She's really curious. She wants to know how things work. and. She passes on that training to her graduate students and they go off and do great things. Yes. And to me, that's what I love to say to kids. Science is about being curious, asking questions yes. and exploring that. And yes. I think other things sometimes muddy it and get in the way. But if you can keep that purity, oh my goodness. Yes. When she accepts admission to the Royal Society, it's brilliant. Yes. But as a woman, you have lower expectations. And having lower expectations, you just get on with the job. Yes, yes. You're not distracted by <laughs> no. all the accolades. and No, you're, yes. you're not looking for the, the next prize or somebody to give you a big tick. Yes. You know, what you're looking for is the next result. In a letter written when she knew she was dying, Marjorie said, I have just got on to the most interesting piece of research I have ever done. And where it's going to turn next, I just don't know.